Fort Snelling played a major role in one of the most significant and tragic events in the history of the state of Minnesota, an event that still has repercussions today. Join me as I walk the Pike Island Trail along the Minnesota River and relate the story of the aftermath of the U.S.-Dakota War of 1862 and the Dakota internment camp that was built along the Minnesota River beneath Fort Snelling. Fort Snelling State Park and Pike Island sit at the confluence of the Mississippi and Minnesota rivers. Before you visit the state park, check the park's website to see what trails and facilities are open. To enter state parks, you'll need to purchase a vehicle permit if you don't have one. Because Pike Island and Fort Snelling are so rich in history, I've split this walk into two videos. In the first video, I walked the trail along the Mississippi River and talked about Zebulon Pike, the man for whom the island is named. In this video, I'll return to the trailhead along the Minnesota River side of the island and talk about the aftermath of the U.S.-Dakota War. Many maps, like the Google map, now label the confluence of the Mississippi and Minnesota rivers as Bedote. Bedote is a Dakota word that means where two waters come together. To the Dakota, this Bedote is a sacred space, a place of great cultural and historical significance. According to Dakota oral tradition, this Bedote is a place of creation, where the Dakota descended from the stars to be on earth. I'm now walking alongside the Minnesota River, or Minnesota Wakpa to the Dakota. This river flows through the heart of the Dakota homeland, which they called Minnesota Makocha, the land where the waters reflect the clouds. The Minnesota River Valley, upstream from Pike Island, was the site of a great tragedy for both the European immigrants to Minnesota and the Dakota. In 1862, on what was then the Minnesota frontier, the Dakota fought a war against the United States and the white immigrants. And here on the bottomland beneath Fort Snelling, in the aftermath of that war, the United States Army constructed an internment camp, or as some call it, a concentration camp, to confine the Dakota before they were sent into exile here at the Badote and banished from Minnesota Makocha their ancestral homeland. The U.S. Dakota War of 1862 had its roots back in 1805 when Zebulon Pike negotiated a treaty for the Dakota to cede land for a military reservation at the Bedote, what today we know as Fort Snelling. After 1805, European immigration and the westward expansion of the United States put more pressure on the Dakota to sign more treaties and cede more of their homeland. By 1858, the Dakota were confined to two reservations that stretched along the south bank of the Minnesota River. The Upper Sioux Agency for the Wahpeton and Sisseton bands of the Dakota and the Lower Sioux Agency for the Midwakatan and Wapakuti bands. Historian Gary Anderson in his book, Massacre in Minnesota, called the U.S. Dakota War of 1862 the most violent ethnic conflict in American history. Many factors contributed to this conflict. The Dakota were near starvation, game was scarce, the crops had failed, the annuity payment was late, the government officials and traders handling Indian affairs were corrupt, and the traditional way of life for the Dakota was disappearing as immigrants settled in their former homeland. On August 17th, at Acton, Minnesota, four young Dakota men, 
returning from an unsuccessful hunt, killed five white settlers. They fled back to their village to report what they had done. Throughout the night, the Dakota debated what they should do. They knew that punishment for these four Dakota men, or perhaps for the entire village, was inevitable. They also knew the United States, preoccupied with a civil war, was in a weakened state. Little Crow, the grandson of the Little Crow who met with Zebulon Pike five decades earlier, reluctantly agreed to lead the Dakota in a war against the United States and the white settlers. The next day, the Dakota attacked the government outpost at the Lower Sioux Agency, killing 23 traders and government employees. In Renville and Brown counties, they killed about 200 white settlers and took many women and children captive. When news of the attacks reached St. Paul, Governor Alexander Ramsey appointed Colonel Henry Sibley to lead the state's military response. Colonel Sibley and his militia headed up the Minnesota River to end the rebellion and free the captives. Similarly, to put down the Dakota uprising, the U.S. Army sends Major General John Pope to St. Paul to take command of the Army's Department of the Northwest. For the next five weeks, across the Minnesota frontier, the hostile Dakota continued their attacks against the U.S. government and the settlers. In this video, I'm not going to go into any detail about the battles that were fought between Sibley's forces and the Dakota. However, if you want to learn more about the war, check the description of this video for some resources. Not all the Dakota supported the decision to go to war. Historians estimate that about one half of the Dakota supported the decision, and some only through threats and intimidation. In general, the Dakota at the Lower Sioux Agency supported the war, while those at the Upper Sioux Agency did not. Some Dakota, called friendlies because they were friends of the white settlers, help protect the settlers from the hostile Dakota. The war ended on September 23rd at Wood Lake when the Minnesota militia encountered the hostile Dakota. Colonel Sibley and his forces overpowered the Dakota. Little Crow and many of the hostile Dakota escaped and fled towards the Dakota Territory and Canada. After the battle at Wood Lake, Colonel Sibley headed further up the Minnesota River to the Upper Sioux Agency. At a camp that today we call Camp Release, the friendly Dakota took custody of the white women, the children, and the mixed bloods that the hostile Dakota had captured during the war. When Sibley arrives at the camp, the friendly Dakota turn over the captives to him. Since many hostile Dakota had escaped, Sibley sends Lieutenant Colonel William Marshall into the Dakota Territory to capture as many as he can. Over the next several weeks, Colonel Sibley takes about 1,600 Dakota into custody and appoints a military commission to try the Dakota warriors who had taken part in the uprising. During the first five weeks of the conflict, historians estimate that the Dakota killed about 600 whites, many of whom were women and children. Among the Dakota, during the first five weeks of the conflict, historians estimate that about 27 Dakota were killed. Although General Pope declared the war over on October 9th, the conflict continued for another three years. During this time, Dakota deaths will dramatically increase. Winter is now bearing down on the Minnesota frontier. Food is scarce, and Sibley needs to feed both his own militia and the Dakota that he has captured. Sibley decides to move his camp 
40 miles back down the Minnesota River to the Lower Sioux Agency. Here, the military commission completed the trials of the Dakota men. Even then, the trials were controversial. Protestant missionaries were the harshest critics, calling the military commission incompetent and the trials an injustice. In some cases, the military commission handed down a guilty verdict in about five minutes without much evidence. The military commission tried 392 Dakota men, sentencing 303 to death, 22 to prison, and acquitting 69. Since Colonel Sibley and General Pope did not have the legal authority to carry out the executions, they forwarded the cases of the 303 condemned prisoners to President Lincoln, who could sanction their executions. Sibley, now promoted to Brigadier General, moved the condemned prisoners to Camp Lincoln, just south of Mankato. Many white citizens, whose relatives or neighbors had been killed by the Dakota, now wanted revenge. As the convoy of shackled Dakota men passed through New Alm, a mob of angry citizens, many of whom were reburying their dead, attacked the prisoners, injuring 15. A bayonet charge by Sibley's soldiers drove back the enraged citizens. Once they reached Camp Lincoln, another mob of citizens, this time from Ankato, marched towards the camp with the intent of killing all the prisoners. Once again, Sibley's troops drove back the mob. To protect the Dakota men, Sibley moved the prisoners into a log prison in Mankato. While General Sibley and General Pope waited for a decision from President Lincoln, Pope ordered that the non-combatants, those Dakota women, children, elders, and mixed bloods, who had not participated in the uprising, be moved here to Fort Snelling, where they could be confined until Congress reached a decision on their fate. While Sibley led the condemned prisoners to Mankato, Lieutenant Colonel William Marshall led the non-combatants to Fort Snelling. As the Dakota marched to Fort Snelling, they created a column of people, horses, and wagons that stretched for nearly four miles. To say that the citizens of Minnesota in 1862 hated the Dakota is an understatement. The white population saw only an ethnicity they couldn't differentiate between the hostile Dakota and the friendly Dakota. As a column of innocent Dakota passed through Henderson, Minnesota, a mob of angry citizens attacked the Dakota with knives, guns, clubs, and stones. The mob tried to grab the Dakota and beat them. They snatched one baby from its mother's arms and threw it to the ground, killing it before the soldiers could subdue the attackers. On November 13th, the train of Dakota reached Fort Snelling. The Dakota set up a temporary camp about a mile from the fort while the soldiers began constructing a stockade on the bottomland beneath the fort. In early December, the fears of the Dakota were realized. The soldiers moved the Dakota into the stockade. The stockade walls, 12 to 14 feet tall, enclosed an area of two to three acres. Here the Dakota erected their teepees, 200 to 250 in total. The camp confined the friendly Dakota as prisoners, but it also protected them from the enraged white citizens of Minnesota who wanted to see them all dead. In Washington, D.C., Lawyers for President Lincoln were reviewing the trial records of the 303 Dakota men being held at the Mankato prison. President Lincoln directed his lawyers to identify the Dakota men who had committed rape. Finding only two, President Lincoln then asked the lawyers to identify those who had murdered civilians. The lawyers identified another 37. On December 6th, President Lincoln wrote the names of those 39 Dakota men 
to be executed for rape and murder and sent the list to General Sibley. The Minnesota congressional delegation was furious that President Lincoln did not order the execution of all the Dakota prisoners. They sent a protest letter filled with misinformation and exaggeration to Lincoln. President Lincoln responded with his own letter to Congress detailing the careful examination of the trial records. The trial records, he noted, did not contain much evidence for the widespread rape and physical abuse of white women that the Minnesota congressional delegation claimed had occurred. Then, as now, the validity of the trials and the guilt or innocence of the Dakota men is a subject of an ongoing debate. While preparations were being made for the executions, the sentence of one Dakota man was changed from death to imprisonment. After a one-week delay, the 38 condemned Dakota men were taken to the gallows on December 26th. In front of a crowd of about 4,000 people, the 38 Dakota men were hung. To this day, this remains the largest mass execution in American history. When they heard of the hangings at Mankato, the Dakota at the Fort Snelling internment camp feared what was planned for them. Without any information about their fate, rumors that all the men were to be executed and the women made slaves only multiplied their fears. Their fears were not unfounded. In the aftermath of the war, the state's newspapers, like the state's white citizens, placed all the blame for the war on the Dakota. Many newspapers called for retribution. The state's political leaders were no different. Governor Alexander Ramsey called all Dakota ruthless assassins, ravishers of wives and sisters and daughters, and destroyers of homes and property. Governor Ramsey stated that the Dakota had to either be exterminated or banished from the state. While some argued for extermination, others advocated for the removal of the Dakota to an isolated location far from the state's borders. One popular location was Isle Royale, the island in Lake Superior near the coast of Ontario, Canada. The suggestion was that this island should be a penal colony, not just for the Dakota, but also for the other tribes in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. The only friends the Dakota now had were the missionaries who had been working among them for several decades. The missionaries had learned the Dakota language, so they were able to converse with them. Both at the camp beneath Fort Snelling and in the prison in Mankato, the missionaries established schools to occupy the prisoner's time. Traveling between Mankato and Fort Snelling, the missionaries were the only method of communication between Dakota family members, carrying news and letters between loved ones. The missionaries were frequent visitors in the internment camp, but they were not the only visitors. For photographers from the photography studios in St. Paul, photographing the Dakota in the camp was a financial windfall. The photographers sold carte de visite of the Dakota. Carte de visite were small, two and a half by four inch photographs that were popular during the Civil War era. Joel Whitney, one of the photographers from St. Paul, bragged that he sold tens of thousands of one photograph of an elderly Dakota woman and that some of his photographs had reached collections in Europe. The photographers likely gave a few of their photos as gifts to the Dakota women. The missionaries then carried these photos to Mankato and gave them to her relatives in the prison. During the winter of 1862 to 1863, Epidemics of measles, diphtheria, and typhoid broke out in the Minnesota River Valley, including at Fort Snelling and in St. Paul. Everyone was affected, soldiers, the white population, 
and the Dakota at both the Mankato Prison and the Fort Snelling internment camp. Overcrowding and a lack of sanitary conditions contributed to the spread of the diseases. Although the exact number of Dakota deaths isn't known, historians estimate that 200 Dakota died from these diseases during the winter. In spring, after a harsh winter, the floodwaters rose on the Minnesota River and the internment camp was in danger of flooding. The Army moved the camp to the top of the bluff, about a mile from Fort Snelling. In February of 1863, the Dakota finally learned their fate. On February 16th, the U.S. Congress passed the Abrogation Act. This legislation declared null and void all previous treaties with the Dakota, seized all their land, and stripped the Dakota of their annuity payments. Later that month, the U.S. Congress passed the Winnebago Removal Act and the Dakota Removal Act. These acts authorized President Lincoln to remove both the Winnebago and the Dakota from Minnesota and to move them to a tract of unoccupied land outside the borders of any existing state. The Winnebago resided on a reservation south of Mankato and had taken little part in the war. Their traditional homeland was in Wisconsin, but they had already been relocated to Iowa before being moved to Minnesota. The Winnebago resented the Dakota for starting the war and being forced to move again. The remaining prisoners at Mankato, once steamboats could navigate the Minnesota River in the spring, would be transferred to a prison at Camp McLennan at Davenport, Iowa. President Lincoln directed William Dole, Secretary of Indian Affairs, and John Usher, Secretary of the Interior, to select a new location for the Dakota and the Winnebago. They decided to locate the tribes on the Missouri River in the Dakota Territory. The specifics were left to Clark Thompson, Superintendent for Indian Affairs. He was directed to select an isolated site that was, both now and in the future, as far from white settlements as possible. He selected a site on the Missouri River, about 150 miles above Fort Randall, at the mouth of Crow Creek. The Crow Creek Reservation is in present-day South Dakota. In April, the Mississippi and Minnesota rivers were free of ice and steamboats could once again navigate their waters. On April 21st, under the cover of darkness, the shackled prisoners at the Mankato Prison were marched from the prison to the steamboat favorite, waiting on the Minnesota River. After stopping at the Fort Snelling steamboat landing, just long enough to drop off those Dakota who had been acquitted, the favorite continued down the Mississippi River to Davenport, Iowa. The Dakota men were then incarcerated in the prison at Camp McLennan. After the removal of the Dakota prisoners from Mankato, preparations began for the removal of the friendly Dakota. The internment camp now held about 1,300 Dakota women and children with a few men. On May 4th, 771 of the Dakota in the internment camp were led to the steamboat Davenport that was waiting at the Fort Snelling steamboat landing. It stopped at St. Paul to take on additional cargo, but a crowd had gathered at the landing and began throwing stones at the Dakota women. Several women were severely injured. A bayonet charge by the soldiers escorting the Dakota to Crow Creek broke up the mob. The next day, a second steamboat, the Northerner, carried the remaining Dakota at the internment camp into exile, this time without incident. On May 9th and 10th, steamboats headed back up the Minnesota River to Mankato. About 2,000 Winnebagos were then loaded onto the steamboats and taken to the internment camp at Fort Snelling. They remained in the camp for a few days before being sent to the Crow Creek Reservation. <laughs>
with the arrival of the Winnebagos on June 24th, the removal to Crow Creek was complete. The hatred of the Dakota by many Minnesotans did not end with the hangings at Mankato or with their removal from Minnesota. They wanted to see those Dakota who had escaped to the Dakota Territory in Canada captured and punished. In the spring of 1863, the Dakota who fled Minnesota in the aftermath of the war started to return. Sibley scouts, friendly Dakota, and mixed-blood men captured many returning Dakota. Some Dakota, near starvation and barely able to walk, surrendered. These Dakota were then brought to the Fort Snelling internment camp. Unlike the first group of Dakota at the internment camp, who were innocent non-combatants and mostly women, this group of Dakota were willing participants in the uprising and primarily men. Roving bands of Dakota continued their attacks on the Minnesota frontier, killing settlers and soldiers. To address the attacks, Oscar Malmross, Minnesota's adjutant general, issued a general order offering a bounty or reward of $25 for the scalp of a hostile Dakota man. Later, he increased the reward to $75 and then to $200. Four Minnesotans collected rewards, totaling $325, for killing Dakota men before Oscar Malmros issued another general order revoking the payment of bounties. About four to 5,000 Dakota still roam the northern plains. In the summer of 1863, to prevent attacks on the Minnesota frontier, General Sibley led an expedition into the Dakota Territory to capture or kill any Dakota that they found. Sibley went as far as present-day Bismarck, North Dakota, in pursuit of the Dakota. He attacks and defeats the Dakota in battles at Big Mound, Dead Buffalo Lake, and Stony Lake in the Northern Dakota Territory. The Dakota who surrendered or were captured on either the Minnesota frontier or on the Northern Plains were sent to the internment camp at Fort Snelling. They too were then removed to Crow Creek or to the prison in Davenport, Iowa. The internment camp remained occupied with Dakota prisoners until June of 1864, when the last Dakota men were sent to Davenport. A while later, the internment camp was dismantled. For the Dakota who had been sent into exile, the new reservation at Crow Creek was a barren waste. That area was experiencing a severe drought, and the soil was so rocky that no crops would grow. Game was scarce. Illness, malnutrition, and starvation soon set in. By the spring of 1864, about 200 had died, mostly children, from illness and starvation. With the harsh living conditions and the high death rate, after three years, the U.S. government had to move the Dakota again, this time to the Santee Reservation in Nebraska. Here, life for the Dakota, over time, improved. The descendants of the Dakota banished from Minnesota have remained on the Santee Reservation to this day. The Winnebago also left Crow Creek and resettled on the Omaha Reservation in Nebraska. The prisoners at Camp McLennan suffered from harsh conditions too. The missionaries, working on behalf of the Christian Dakota, worked to secure their release from prison. On April 30th, 1864, about a year after they arrived, President Lincoln pardoned 25 of the prisoners. These prisoners were then reunited with their relatives at Crow Creek. In 1866, after three years in prison, President Andrew Johnson pardoned the remaining prisoners. These Dakota men were then sent to the Santee Reservation. In a few days, the women and children from Crow Creek arrived, 
reuniting many families that had been separated for four years. Some Dakota continued to wander the northern plains. Eventually, the U.S. government established reservations for them at Sisseton and Flandreau, South Dakota, Devil's Lake, North Dakota, and in northeastern Montana. For those Dakota who had fled across the border, Canada established reservations for the Dakota in Manitoba and Saskatchewan. Not all the Dakota were sent into exile. Some friendly Dakota, those who had aided the white settlers during the war or who had served as scouts for Henry Sibley, were allowed to remain in Minnesota. For many years, they were without land and lived in poverty. Before the war, historians estimate that Minnesota was home to about 6,000 Dakota, a special census in 1883 counted only 237 Dakota living in Minnesota. In the 1880s, despite being banished from Minnesota, more Dakota were returning to their ancestral homeland. With the help of a sympathetic representative in Congress, the federal government began purchasing land for these Dakota. Communities were established at Granite Falls and Morton in the Minnesota River Valley, at Prairie Island along the Mississippi River, and at Pryor Lake. Dakota communities at these locations have continued to this day, re-establishing the Dakota presence in Minnesota. I'm now near the end of this walk. Before you leave the park, check out the Remembering and Honoring Memorial. This memorial is near the trailhead for the Pike Island Trails. The Dakota community erected this memorial in 1987 to honor the 1,600 Dakota, mostly women and children, who are confined in the internment camp near the memorial. The U.S.-Dakota War was a terrible tragedy. Hundreds of white settlers in Dakota, most of whom were civilians or noncombatants, lost their lives. There's much more to learn about the Dakota, the uprising, the internment camp, the expulsion of the Dakota from Minnesota, and their return to their homeland. I can't go into a lot of detail in this short video. I hope something that I said sparked your interest to learn more. To get you started, I've included some resources in the description of this video. Walking Pike Island is good for the body, and learning about the events that happened here is good for the aging brain.